Hello, everyone. Ladislas Maurice from TheWanderingInvestor.com. So today I'm really excited to be talking to Tim Stermos, who manages a fund specializing in frontier African stock markets. Tim, how are you? Good. Thank you, Ladislas. It's nice to be back talking to you. Yeah. So, Tim, your fund is very unique in the sense that it focuses on Africa, excluding North Africa and excluding South Africa. So you really focus on all the frontier markets right there in sub-Saharan Africa. And you have about $23 million under management. And can you tell us a little bit about the, the past few years, just for 30 seconds to get an overview? And then we'll be discussing the outlook for 2024 for all the, the main markets in that part of Africa. Sure. Yes, that's right. Uh, I started the fund during uh, the COVID time in 2020 and started investing capital here in Tanzania, where I'm based on October 1, 2020. We had a, a decent few months for the, the final part of 2020 where we were in existence. And then we had a pretty good 2021. Uh, the fund, I think, was up over 15 percent for that year. And the last couple of years as well, we've made money in US dollar terms after all fees. Uh, we were up 5.2% last year. And in total, the fund has been up 43.7% uh, since inception. Uh, that's in US dollar terms after all fees and expenses. So it's been a pretty good journey, even though the times have been rather challenging in, in Africa, which we can get into. Cool. Look, this is a topic that I find absolutely fascinating, having lived and worked myself in, uh, in various parts of Africa for, for seven years. I actually spent most of my 20s in Africa. So let's discuss your main markets um, from big to small in terms of your allocation. The first one being Tanzania, where your fund has a essentially over 50% allocation to Tanzania, which is odd to say the least uh but it's been the right call yeah that's right we have invested since 2018 here in a personal capacity and the, when the fund got going it was still the case that i figured uh valuations in terms of blue chip companies the the value for money that you got was was the best of anywhere in africa yeah there were structural reasons for that there had been a, a banking uh collapse and and a political regime that no one liked here and it had left valuations very depressed so when we started investing you know you could pick up blue chip companies here trading at mid single digit PEs uh, that have 80 even 90 percent market share in, in some cases so that's the history of it because i was starting a new fund i could go in when the valuations were depressed a lot of the other funds that had been in business uh since early in the 2000s or 2014 i think was the peak year in africa a lot of them were stuck in tanzania and wanting to get out so we took advantage of that picking up uh, valuations or picking up stocks on low valuations from the people that were looking to exit and we've done very well like our biggest holding is the biggest bank here in the country nmb bank which we picked up for around 1,700 shillings a share. Uh, the last trade that went through on Friday was at 4,600 uh, per share. And it's paid you know, amazing dividends along the way. Earnings have been growing at over 30% a year uh, in the time that we've been investing. So as you say, it's been the right call. I don't think Tanzania is particularly cheap anymore in most cases. There are still some stocks that we like, uh, but there are other places now where we've started deploying capital uh, more regularly, including Kenya, which is our second largest exposure at this but stage. Before going to, to Kenya, so can you give us an example, if people were to buy into your fund right now, that biggest holding of yours in Tanzania, roughly what, what are the metrics at current valuations, P ratio, dividend yield? Sure. So NMB Bank actually reported its unaudited results just last week. If we take the fourth quarter 2023 number and we annualize it, uh, in other words, assuming zero growth for 2024, for argument's sake, you have a 3.9 times earnings multiple, and it's also an 8% dividend yield. Okay. So that's uh, pretty attractive still. But as I say, the stock has run all the way from uh, under 2,000 to more than 4,600. Uh, but the, of course, the earnings have grown just as fast. 
are you are you trimming Tanzania a little bit to deploy into other markets? Yes, uh, we obviously are a funds management business, so we're reliant on fund inflows and redemptions, and we have to juggle a few factors. Ideally, I would get a lot more people putting money in the fund and I would just invest that and I wouldn't be trimming. But in terms of capital allocation, yes, we have trimmed our NMB position slightly uh, in the last six months. And we're also looking for chances to to trim other things Uh If we don't get large fund inflows, that's probably the best way uh, for us to allocate investors' funds going forward. Okay, clear. So look, Kenya, um, I'm going to add a chart here showing the NSC20 index. I don't know, it's just been cratering and cratering. Uh, Kenya is starting to be disturbingly cheap. What's what's happening there? Uh, what's your outlook? What are you buying? <laughs> yeah, I have the same feeling as, as you. Uh, I was early to declare that Kenya was cheap. It was cheap and it got cheaper. I know you visited Kenya as well yeah, it was uh, cheap. in the not, not too distant uh, past. And the main surprise, I guess, was that the currency has fallen as much as it has. Uh, the Kenyan shilling traditionally depreciates, but not as badly as many other African currencies. In the time that I have been investing uh, for the fund in Kenya, the currency has gone from about 105 to the US dollar to around 160 now. And there was even a time last year where you, you couldn't even get any dollars if you tried. You know, people were hoarding dollars in anticipation of a further slide. Obviously, they, they thought that that was a good way to speculate and make money. However, recently, it seems to have found a, a level. Uh, the low recently on the official uh, officially quoted rate was 162, and it's closer to 160 now. So for the first time in many, many months, there were actually a couple of days where the Kenyan shilling bounced. It gained ground against the dollar instead of a, lent, a relentless sort of downward slide. And the main reasons for this are well known. The country has a fairly large euro bond repayment due in June this year, which they have to meet in dollars. There was a concern that they may not be able to roll it over. That concern, I think, it's still there, uh, but it has lessened. It seems as though African frontier debt markets are open again. Ivory Coast raised some money uh, in the euro bond market last week or the week before, $2.6 billion, which is quite substantial. So we can talk a little bit about, about that later when we get to Ivory Coast. But Kenya basically has seen a relentless slide in the stock index and the currency, as, as you correctly point out. And it's left you know great blue chip companies selling at valuations that are extremely attractive in my opinion as long as your assumption is that you know Kenya doesn't disappear off the map uh, and, and go to zero which I think is is very far-fetched the government knows that they have to pay this euro bond off they've been doing a lot of things uh, that are quite painful uh, in terms of raising taxes and levies and, and all sorts of things to raise this money and I, I don't think that there's any um, high probability that they will default, barring any sort of unforeseen catastrophic events between now and June. They should get that over the line. The market should breathe a sigh of relief, and maybe we may even get a little bit of uh, economic sunshine in the second half of the year. That's kind of my base case assumption. Stock markets have discounted all of that and then some. Uh, we have been adding quite heavily to our position in Safaricom, which is Kenya's largest company. It's the biggest mobile phone company there for those unfamiliar with Kenya. But it's also much more important than that. It is the single most important company for making payments in the economy. Uh, their mobile money platform is used by almost everyone to transfer money and, and pay for things. And it's really a, a company that's integral to the entire economy in that respect. It's partly a government owned, partly owned by the Vodacom group and partly owned by the public. Um, very, very uh, well managed company. Uh, and the shares have been completely hammered down from mid 40s, 45, all the way down to I think the low was 1150. I didn't wow. manage to pick up any uh, quite at that level, but I, I did buy a, a large block at uh, 12 and a half, I think. For what, the are fund, the, so. what are the metrics right now? 
So Safaricom is a little bit tricky. Uh, most analysts value it based on a discounted cash flow, which includes the negative value of their Ethiopian business, which is currently losing money because it's just in the startup phase and they're they're in the capital expenditure cycle there. But the way I look at it, uh, which is a sum of parts, I look at the Kenyan business as a standalone, and then I value Ethiopia. I don't value Ethiopia as being negative. I value Ethiopia as having some value, namely uh, sort of the capital expenditure that they've outlaid so far. But if you if you look at it from that metric, it's uh, it's on a high single digit PE. Uh, it yields nine percent now, based on the historical dividend. It's it's really got to the point where it's it's a high quality company trading for a cheap valuation. It used to be a high quality company trading for an extremely high uh, valuation, much like you know all the famous U.S. tech stocks. It was in that category during the boom. A lot of frontier and emerging markets fund they had an allocation to Safaricom uh, because of the the high quality nature of the business and, and the sort of techiness of the, the mobile money. Uh, um, but that all changed. Sentiment is is terrible towards Kenya. Foreign funds decided that they wanted their money out before the Kenyan shilling collapsed. And you saw the shares uh, go from a peak, as I said, of 44 or 45 in 2021, all the way down to 11 uh, recently. Any other interesting sectors in, in Kenya, like banking or insurance or consumer goods? We have been buying shares in KCB. Uh, there are two uh, dominant banks in Kenya, although it's a quite fragmented banking industry. The two big banks are Equity Group and KCB. Uh, Equity Group is a company that's uh, founder-driven and has quite a large business in the Democratic Republic of Congo which they're focusing on. KCB is is a government-owned uh, institution historically, um, and it's more focused on the Kenyan market. Uh, and it's also trading at a much lower valuation than equity. So recently, we, we started buying KCB. Uh, again, it's one of these uh, stocks that uh, you've seen collapse from, I think it was in the 40s, uh, and it went all the way down to 17 uh, recently. There was a, a period briefly late last year where it dropped off a cliff from 30 down to 17. And that's when I decided that it was just too cheap to ignore. And in dollar uh, terms, I mean, the, the drop is even bigger in dollar terms. Exactly, because of the, the Kenyan shilling having lost uh, about 25% as well in that time frame. Cool. So if people want cheap, um, they can look at Kenya right now. Yeah, but also quality in the case of Safaricom. It's not just cheap value stocks. It's actually cheap, um, you know, quality businesses. In relatively fast-growing economies, because Kenya is growing, what, like 5% a year, roughly? Yes, it continues to eke out decent economic growth. Uh, even with these challenges, they had a drought uh, back in 2020 and 2021, if I'm not mistaken, much more favorable weather conditions uh, mean that the agricultural economy has been doing well in the last six to 12 months. And that's important in a place like that where a lot of people rely on uh, both subsistence farming and also cash crops. Kenya is quite famous for agricultural exports uh, to the European Union and also cut flowers, tea, a lot of cash crops. So the fact that... Um, the weather has been kinder to them is is a good thing for the future of uh, the economy there. Economic growth is holding up, uh, even in, in spite of all these challenges that they faced with the, the debt and, and the currency. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Um, so your third biggest position is Tiny Rwanda, correct? That's right. Uh, it's, it's almost a tie between Rwanda and Senegal. Uh, Rwanda as you know, is is a small country infamous for the genocide that occurred there in the early 1990s, uh, but more recently has been quite well regarded as a reforming country uh, run by a, a strong man who, uh, if, if you listen to the positives, he, he's a benevolent dictator that's doing all the right things and turning Rwanda into Singapore. Opinions are mixed on that, uh, but I have friends who live in Rwanda who uh, you know, report back that the, the place is continuing to make good progress. Uh, they don't have a lot of listed companies, but the ones that we have been invested in or are still invested in are, are 
completely dominant. Uh, the stock that we own there is the leading uh, brewing company. It's also the Coca-Cola bottling subsidiary. Uh, and it's it's just well managed and, and does very well uh, year in, year out. So we're comfortable with that. We have had exposure in the past to the biggest bank in Rwanda as well. Uh, but we took the opportunity to exit that late last year and switch the money into uh, the brewing company that we own. So we have just over six and a half percent of the portfolio in that company in, in Rwanda. And what are the the metrics on that one, roughly? So it has been yielding double digits, and it was also trading at a high single digit uh, PE multiple uh, when we topped up our shares recently. Great, Tim. So there's this one country that I'm very bullish on, which is Senegal. So it's been having a few political issues. Um, There is a lot of ongoing tension. But from an economic point of view, what's happening in in Senegal is quite amazing with all the oil and gas that they found that's finally coming to production. I think GDP growth is projected to be almost 10% this year in 2024, um, also very high in 2025. So can you tell us a bit about your your allocation to Senegal and also what you think of some of the the political risks in Senegal? Because there's been a lot of anti-government protests. Um, the, the people, the street is increasingly anti-French. And we've seen how that's turned out in the Sahel, which is not the same, different people, et cetera. But still, there's a lot of tension in West Africa when it comes to the French um, former colonialism. Yes. So actually, just over the weekend, uh, the Senegalese president, uh, Macky Sall, he postponed the upcoming elections. Uh, So we're not sure exactly how that's going to fall out, but he has cited uh, too much political tension. Uh, I think there's about 20 different candidates for this election. He has announced he's stepping aside. He's not running. uh, So he's honoring the two-term limit. Uh, but there is a prominent opposition candidate who was jailed on what some people think are trumped up charges. He was on a hunger strike. He's been let out. Uh, he's running, uh, as well as a number of other candidates, including obviously guys that Macky Sall hopes are going to win because they'll be his anointed successors. So it's quite messy politically, as you say. Economically, uh, the country does continue to do well. Oil and gas, uh, as you correctly cite, is is a very important sector there. Uh, some big offshore discoveries, long lead times to develop these things, but it seems as though finally they're going to see some cash flow. But our exposure in in Senegal has actually been through the largest mobile phone company there. It's not only active in Senegal; it's also active in Mali and then smaller the some of the smaller countries there, Guinea, Guinea Bissau, and uh, Sierra Leone. But uh, it's done well for us. It's Dominant the same way that Safaricom is in Kenya with uh, nearly 60% market share in, in most of these markets. Uh, it, it has the dominant mobile money platform, although there were some challenges. Uh, there were some Silicon Valley funded startups that came in and undercut them. So they had some challenges, especially in Senegal and then also in Mali. But uh, we've done well on that position. It continues to trade at a sub seven times earnings multiple and yields well into double digits. So we've been happy with our exposure in Senegal. I haven't gone and visited the country yet. That's something that's on my to-do list, perhaps for later this year. At that point, I think I would feel more comfortable with looking for other exposures. Sonatel is a, a large company, is a subsidiary of uh, Orange out of France, and they attend a lot of the conferences that I go to. So I've sat down and met face-to-face with management both in Dubai and in Cote d'Ivoire last year. I was at a conference in Abidjan where their senior management were there. But to to meet other companies in Senegal, I think I, I, I need to go and actually put boots on the ground. And uh, later in the year is uh, is quite likely. It's well worth it. It's a beautiful country. Um, I definitely want to go back at, at some point. And yeah, what's interesting about Senegal as well is, well, one, um, the president, you know, kind of pushing back the elections, that would have been pre-approved by the French. So that's one, because um, he was yeah. quite close to them. And two, though Senegal is going to see about 10% growth this year, thanks to oil and gas. Actually, I was reading some reports and the growth without oil and gas would have been about 6%. So 
So Still it's not solid, just yeah. it's not just an oil and gas boom. There are very good fundamentals in um, in Senegal. About that point that you mentioned about American VCs coming into African markets and then trying to undercut the the local big guys. So personally, when I was working in Africa, you'd see all these VC types, like these Americans, they come, they come down, they have big smiles, they're going to change Africa, this, that, they come with a bunch of money, big splash. Typically within two years, they're gone. Yeah. Is, th is this it's, something it's that, that you're still operating. seeing? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, look, there, there are some successes, but in general, and if I use this specific example in, uh, in Senegal and Mali, Uh, this company that came in is a company called Wave, or that that's the brand that they use for their their local uh, mobile money offering. And basically, the only thing they really had to offer was to undercut on price. So it's a typical Silicon Valley business model where they just lower the price to a level where the company doesn't make any money, hemorrhages cash. And the strategy is basically reliant on their investors continue to pump money into the venture capital company so that they can go and burn it in Africa. And I think those days are probably gone after last year with rates having uh, gone up so much in the US. Now, here in East Africa, I, I do have a local friend and, and contact who, who works with VCs, uh, and they have had some success, mainly in agribusiness. You know, they come in and, and they actually help improve existing processes and work with the existing entrepreneurs to improve their offering. That seems to be the model that works rather than trying to come in and compete uh, with, with the locals on, on a different uh, price parameter. Because the only other success story I can think of when it comes to Americans is what, okay. So some natural resources plays and KFC, um, <laughs> But generally speaking, right. Americans don't do well in Africa. I don't know. That's been my yeah. Story. I mean, the the Coca Cola company obviously is yeah. everywhere. Uh, they they have a model of buying up, you know, well regarded local brands, both in bottled water and soft drinks, and then just integrating them into the Coca Cola distribution system. So that sort of works. Uh, but yeah, it's it's tough to bring Silicon Valley type scale it quickly and uh, and grow grow grow. Uh, it, it's not really um, working. Jumia was a, a famous example in recent years also. It's not an American company, but uh, they they copied the Amazon business model and they wanted to be the Amazon of Africa as a couple of uh, Swiss and French guys, I, I think. And they, they got it listed on the New York Stock Exchange, raised a bunch of money, and they burnt almost all of it. And they have no prayer of showing a profit anytime soon. I remember when I worked in West Africa, um, it was back then, it was littered with young, bright Europeans who were working for Jumia on various ventures, you know, selling uh, cars yeah, online, so back then. Yeah, food yeah. delivery, and I don't know, like online, all these online businesses, they were all in charge of the business. And then when I'd make them talk about their, uh, like the, the business model, like they, they were hemorrhaging money. Like there's no yeah. ways these people would ever ever be profitable yeah so that's that's been the model elsewhere in the world uh, it's worked in in some limited uh places but not something that works in africa you you got to be very savvy operationally to to make money here you can't just come in and splash uh, money around left right and center and, and hope that you grow large enough uh, to stick yeah generally when it comes to business in Africa, I would prefer to back um, Europeans. They generally have a much better understanding of, of the market and how things work and you know getting things done on the ground, as well as the Chinese and the, the Indians and yeah. the Turks. Um, yeah, think. there are a lot of a uh, lot of Lebanese entrepreneurs also well, in yeah. West Africa that do very well. Um, although the, even there, there are, there are half some of them have, Half of them have uh, West African passports, though. True. Yeah, they're they're local. Exactly. Cool. So, okay. So that's Senegal. So you're bullish. You have a position. That's good. What about the other French ogre in the region, um, Ivory Coast? 
Ivory Coast, I, I visited and, and put boots on the ground last year. It's not somewhere that we have a position at this stage. It's uh, it's a tough place to do business, uh, very Byzantine. Uh, the business culture is, is not something that uh, I'm all that familiar with. There was a listing of um, a telco there as well, Orange Cote d'Ivoire, so a sister company to um, Sonatel in, in Senegal. That's the one that's on my watch list, but it never got cheap enough, unfortunately, for, for me to get excited. Uh, they have been doing reasonably well. Uh, I think the IPO was at 10,000 West African francs. The low was maybe 9,000. And now it's back up to, I think, between 10 and a half and 11,000. So it's it's holding its ground, uh, but it doesn't have the same sort of uh, valuation metrics that Sonatel does because it was listed recently. And of course, the investment bankers uh, tried to maximize the price. And uh, so watching, waiting, hoping that I might get a chance to buy that one a bit lower down. Other things we've watched in Ivory Coast uh, are in the commodity space. Uh, there's a palm oil company uh, that that is quite dominant there. Of course, it's also famous for cocoa. Uh, it's one of the big centers for growing cocoa beans in the world, along with Ghana. Uh, no easy way to get local exposure to that. Uh, but I do have a, a cocoa company, trading company in Switzerland on my watch list as well that operates in Cote d'Ivoire along with many other places and that's an industry that seems to have a good long-term future okay didn't you have some like cardboard company in the portfolio and ivory Ah, coast (laughs) yes so i did i did have another ivory coast exposure which was part of the aga khan development network it's a packaging company exactly so not cardboard but um hessian sacks and polypropylene bags for for agri produce uh but it was a a tiny part of our portfolio and I wasn't getting good access to management. And I decided to cut the position uh, based on a a number of factors, Uh, you know, not a disaster, but uh, it it was one that I I didn't feel it made sense to keep holding. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Cause Ivory coast though, it's had, um, I mean, a civil war, uh, I mean, pretty recently, 10 years ago is seen as a safe haven in the region and with everything that's yeah. been happening in in Mali and Burkina Faso and Niger, uh, what Ivory Coast has seen is an inflow of capital coming from these um, Wood- countries. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I'll I'll just give an, an interesting anecdote. Um, so my my father is a university professor. He teaches business, and mm-hmm. a few years ago he gave uh, he taught in Niger for a few weeks. And, Mm -hmm. you know, when he was talking of developed countries, his students from Niger were giving Abidjan as an example of a developed country, right? right? Right. So, um, so really seen in French West Africa as the hub of French West Africa and as a haven of stability, um, in spite of its checkered past. So it's, it's quite interesting. So generally speaking, valuations in Ivory Coast are a bit higher than in other markets because of this uh because of this special status the capital flowing in from uh, yeah. neighboring regions yeah that, that makes sense mm-hmm. cool so let's talk about the the white elephant in the room nigeria <laughs> yeah yeah nigeria is a fascinating place um i i go every year to check the pulse and see what's going on uh, so last to, year, of course. Uh, before, before we go into that, before we go into that, population of Nigeria, so that people understand how big Nigeria is compared to all these other markets. Sure. So, depending on who you listen to and what census you believe, but between 180 and 200 million people, most likely, uh, and that is close to one sixth of the entire African continent in that one little country. So very significant, huge potential market, um, a lot of problems in Nigeria, but also a lot of opportunity is the usual way that it's viewed. Because <laughs> the, the Nigeria is littered with the corpses of people who saw opportunity in Nigeria. Correct. So there are 
a lot of listed companies there, which also makes it uh, something that uh, as a fund manager, I need to focus on. Uh, it was what I considered uninvestable for the first two and a half years or so that I was running the fund because of the exchange rate having been artificially pegged at a very low level and multiple black and gray market foreign exchange rates operating uh, simultaneously. We did use that to our advantage uh, and, and put some money in by uh, some deft maneuvering. You can buy Nigerian shares in London, transfer them to Lagos, and then get a much better exchange rate that way. Uh, but it was not a market that I was uh, prepared to commit significant capital to until uh, that exchange rate issue was sorted out and, and we saw signs of serious reform, which I'm pleased to say we have seen since the election last year. Uh, the new president, Tinubu, seems to not be shy about cracking skulls and getting rid of uh, existing systems that were there for the longest time under his predecessor, Buhari. Of course, I'm sure he has his own vested interests that he's working on behalf of, uh, but he's upended the apple cart, really, and, and there's been a lot of change. The other major change that he introduced was a the abolition of fuel subsidies. So Nigeria was crazy in that petrol was severely subsidized and, and selling for about one-sixth of what diesel was selling for, which wasn't subsidized when I first went there. Uh, so I, it, that was a real eye-opener. And then when I was back last November, uh, you know, the, the petrol subsidies had gone. They'd let the exchange rate uh, go and it was floating. Typically, you could get eight nine hundred for your dollar, eight or nine hundred naira on the official market. You know, if you're paying in a hotel on a credit card, that's that's the rate you get. But on the street and the parallel market, you could still get twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundred. So there was still a problem, obviously, with the functioning of of the market, and that has continued in uh, the first uh, weeks of this year until last week. There was another change uh, where they've basically hauled the banks in and said, look, you have to make a proper market here, stop hoarding FX. You know, you've got to quote volume uh, two-way uh, spreads. And it seems that that now has seen it fall to the, the black market late, uh, rate. So the Naira now is quoted officially, uh, last I checked, at 1391 which is actually even more than I think the last prints in the in the parallel market. So you're now getting a situation where the market may have the possibility to start clearing. The banks have been told that they have to sell FX. Uh, they are. They're getting a rate that they now deem is fair. Instead of 900, they're getting closer to 1400. So of course, they're going to start letting some of their dollars go at these levels. It remains to be seen though, still a lot of... Uh, dust that needs to settle but i'm hearing positive things and uh the traders uh, that we deal with uh, for the fund they've also said that they're seeing larger volumes in the nigerian fx market which is becoming more liquid but it's certainly not uh not a safe stable market where uh it's predictable what you're going to get. I mean, I I don't want to wire my client's money off to to Lagos and run the risk of being quoted a bad exchange rate. You need to see the spreads and the intraday uh, levels narrow before uh, we have full comfort. There was a time uh, in December I was checking on it, and like the FX market had ranged from 770 to 1100 or something in one day, you know, in the session. It's just nice. <laughs> wow. So change of foot, uh, but still in need of, of stabilization before I think uh, your average investor becomes anywhere near remotely comfortable. Okay. So what does that mean for you? Do you consider yourself to be the average investor? Or are you allocating more to Nigeria? Or are you just <laughs> like, what's, we your, have what's your allocation? Put... What's so at the moment, we only have two and a half odd percent in, in Nigeria. So it is okay. tiny as, as far as our fund is concerned. And we have not allocated fresh capital to Nigeria uh, other than reinvesting a dividend that we maybe could have taken out uh, since, well, since uh, beginning of last year, really. So, yeah, we're still tentatively watching and waiting. Um, and as I say, until 
I have some kind of, not guarantee, but comfort that the exchange rate uh, has stabilized, then it's very difficult to to justify sending hard currency uh, into Nigeria. Sure. For sure, for sure. It's a dark hole. Things mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. disappear in, in Nigeria. Um, cool. So tell us about the the subsidies for gas um for petrol because they were partial they were removed but it would appear that they're kind of back in or the price of petrol so hasn't I think really the, gone up but it should have because that's also yeah officially officially the subsidies uh were totally removed but that meant that the price shot up by 500 percent overnight like it, it went up 6x and obviously for the average person who needs to catch a commuter bus to work or drive their car, or whatever. It was very painful. So yes, there has been some kind of backdoor reintroduction uh, that has not made headlines. Uh, petrol prices are still way, way higher than than they were under the subsidized regime, but they're perhaps not yet at uh, the market level that that they should be. The other thing going on in that industry in Nigeria is that uh, Dangote, the uh, the wealthiest Nigerian billionaire, he's actually uh, been building a huge oil refinery and that has finally come online uh, and it is producing refined petroleum products with, at the moment, uh, from what we understand, imported crude. You know, the idea behind it was that it would use Nigerian crude instead of Nigerian crude being sent abroad and then refined and sent back in the form of of petrol and and diesel, that they would use the the oil that they have at home. Uh, But for the moment, it doesn't appear to be that that's the case. So Dangote refinery being up and running is a big positive, but it still seems messy in that they're importing oil from somewhere else to refine and then sell in Nigeria. So who knows where it all uh, ends up. Uh, But it's a country that, you know, without Nigeria firing on all cylinders, it's hard to see Africa firing on all cylinders because of it being so, so dominant. So it's uh, it's one that we watch and, and we're positive that, these reforms are taking place and that, uh, you know, the oil industry and the refinery, the, that's all moving in the right direction. But we do still worry a lot about the operating environment and yeah. the high levels of inflation yeah. and, and the average Nigerian doing it tough, which means there's a lot of insecurity uh, in, in society. And, and uh, you know, also, if you go out in the countryside in Nigeria, there are, there's a lot of banditry and kidnapping and stuff like that, which is never good for the econ- economy. Look, your your point about Africa not being able to fire on all cylinders if Nigeria doesn't. I don't know. I I question that in the sense that there's still so little intra-African trade, um, and especially with Nigeria, like no one no one trades with Nigeria. Um, maybe only like a few countries around. You know, Benin. Well, there's a lot of uh, like informal trade, is is what I would say. You know, mm-hmm. so and and this was a point actually. I I was talking to you earlier that um you know I I recently hired a new colleague. I was talking to my colleague prior to this this call whether there's anything that he thought I should highlight, and that was actually one of the things he pointed out that despite uh you know most people having the uh. uh opinion that trade is sort of centrally directed in Africa and you know there was a lot of political lobbying to uh more harmonize the, the countries and bring them together and encourage trade you know the Africa free trade agreement all this sort of stuff that's all really hot air uh, as you correctly point out <laughs> but at a personal level and at, at an entrepreneurial level people are actually starting uh, to do more trading amongst each other because it's just a natural thing to do. I mean, these borders are really not uh, natural to have in a lot of these countries and people, you know, they will do commerce and trade and and so on, but it's all off the books. The exception being perhaps, you know, some of the the larger publicly listed companies, not so much in in West Africa, uh, which I'm less familiar with, but certainly here in East Africa, for example, you can now move money 
between Safaricom and, and Vodacom here in Tanzania, uh, it, it's all becoming much more integrated and the borders and, and obstacles are, are actually starting to, to disappear. You know, I can go to Kenya and I can pull money out of my Tanzanian uh, mobile really? money account over the counter and, and vice versa. You know? So my colleague was here from Nairobi last week and, you know, he was able to draw on his Kenyan account here in Tanzania. So slowly but surely there are, uh, some signs that these artificial barriers are are, are being taken down, uh, but it's limited. You know, it's big big private sector companies and individuals, uh, small small time traders, and so on. Uh, not not so much the governments. The governments are still all squabbling. <laughs> cool. What about um? Let's move on to Ghana. Ghana is uh, starting to improve. Ghana is a country that has historically had periods of, of boom and then, you know, they get overexcited, spend too much money, borrow too much money, and then the currency collapses, the banking system faces the consequences and they hit the reset button and they start again. And we've seen the same thing happen here over the last five years. That's the Ghana, Ghana cycle. Was, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, Ghana is, is very... Uh, a very rich country uh, in terms of the natural resource endowment that it enjoys gold, cocoa, uh, oil and gas was the thing that started to come online here in the last decade. And the government uh, started spending beyond its means before the oil and gas revenue kicked in uh, is, is my sort of shorthand interpretation. They went off and they issued euro bonds, borrowed a lot of money against the future oil revenues and then they spent them on on projects that unfortunately don't really have any return and probably a lot of the money also went in, in corruption and so on so that's another thing that we structurally see um all over africa actually just if i can digress for a second that a lot of these infrastructure projects that have been built you know the, the, there's no real payback uh while the infrastructure is great and it's there and it's functioning uh the price that they can charge or the economic benefits that the infrastructure brings just isn't there yet uh, to the degree that it's needed to pay off uh, you know, the money that they borrowed. And Ghana was the perfect example of this. Uh, so the currency, when I first started investing money for the fund, was at about 580 to the US dollar. Uh, they defaulted not only on their uh, external debt, but also on domestic debt. So basically, Ghanaian banks, you know, got hosed as well on all the government bonds that they were holding. So there's been a very messy period of adjustment here over the last 12, 18 months. But the currency has finally stabilized at around 12. Uh, the current account uh, is now in surplus. So the currency devaluation has at least worked to bring down sort of frivolous imports and also boost exports. So we're hopeful that that Ghana is now on a more solid footing they still haven't come to any final agreement uh, with with debtors on the exact level of haircuts and so forth. So although Ivory Coast recently raised some money in, in the euro bond market, which was surprising to everyone, I think Ghana is a long way off ever returning <laughs> to the euro bond market. Um, but at least the economy is is turning around and, and they're earning more uh, foreign exchange and the exchange rate seems to have stabilized. We have a small allocation to Ghana as well. Uh, we own MTN Ghana, the dominant mobile phone company there. And we have a legacy position in one of the banks that we're actually trying to sell down for obvious reasons. That was one that we got wrong. <laughs> it's um, I, I lived in Ghana for, for a number of years and it's very dynamic. I mean, the, the, I was in charge for Nestle of both um, Ghana and Ivory Coast for for their for Nestle's respective milk businesses in, in the two countries, and though many of the the tribes are similar in Ghana and in Ivory Coast, just the the economies are just so so different. In Ivory Coast, everything yeah. is bureaucratic, slow, steady, um, yeah, whilst yeah. Ghana is just up and down up and down it's just more chaotic but a lot more dynamic but, yeah, a lot yeah. more dynamic and less bureaucratic right yeah. interesting cool and then you took a position recently in a little gabon actually something that's very easy yeah. for people to trade but that no one talks about 
Right. So Gabon doesn't have a stock market itself, uh, but there are some French companies active there, uh, both in the oil and gas industry and also in minerals. I think Eramet has quite a big business there. Uh, but the one that we took a chance to take a position in was Total Energies Gabon, which is both a upstream and downstream player. So they're partners with the government of Gabon in some of the oil fields, and then they also run the Total Service Station Network in Gabon. And it was kind of a confluence of events. Uh, we had some dividends that we had been paid in Tanzania, and there was a difficulty getting dollars, but we were able to get euros. So we took those euros and we sent them up to our trust uh, trust account in uh, in Europe. And then the coup in Gabon happened. And this stock, Total Energies Gabon, which is on my watch list, is one that I had not been able to buy in enough quantity for it to make it worth my while. You know, when I run $23 million, I need to have at least sort of 1%, 2% of the fund in a position. So half a million dollars, say, was was sort of what I, I needed for it to be worth me spending the time to continue following the company and so on. So when the, the coup happened, there were a bunch of panic sellers, and that allows us the allowed us the opportunity to to pick up a, a few blocks of shares and get exposure there. It's it's a company that has a very lumpy earnings and, and dividend streams, uh, but it trades in Paris, uh, so you can see it in your interactive brokers account if you have one of those, or on Yahoo Finance and, and all the all the finance sites on the internet. And yeah, you know, if you look at the historical numbers, I think it it's on a. 22% dividend yield and about two and a half times earnings or something like that. So it's very cheap. Uh, but as I said, the earnings can be very lumpy. Yeah. Um, suddenly you get dividends and then you don't get dividends for a while. So uh, you never really know. Cool. All right. Look, I think this was, uh, this was really interesting, Tim. Look, overall, having lived in Africa for many years, I, I find that your fund is one of the, the most interesting ways to get exposure to the market there. Um, you invest in blue chip companies in these kind of medium countries in the middle that no one ever discusses. These blue chip yeah. companies that have a lot of moat, they have a lot of market share, uh, they're not expensive, they spit out decent dividend yields, and they're not listed anywhere else. You have to go to the local markets. Yeah, so unless right. people are interested in opening brokerage accounts in Abidjan, in Dar, in Nairobi, in Kigali. <laughs> a lot of work. Yeah, yeah like good <laughs> luck. Um, so it's just one of the easier ways to get access to these markets. And all of these ETFs, these Africa frontier market ETFs, et cetera, that you see in London and Paris and New York, they're mostly just buying commodities companies or a bit of you know a Nestle and whatever Western companies have, ac have exposure to Africa. But if you want true, 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 Africa exposure, excluding North Africa and South Africa that have very different dynamics that you can't compare. Um, I find that your fund is definitely one of the more interesting ways to, to go about it. Like, would I go all in? No, just as you, Tim, with your own money, you're not all in Africa. No one should be all in Africa. But as part of a diversified plan, it is far from crazy to be invested in these markets with amazing demographics, a lot of natural resources, and overall dynamics that are completely different from from other parts of, of the world. Um, That's right. It's it's an uncorrelated exposure, uh, is the way I look at it. For for people who have a broad portfolio, it you'll often find that your African stocks are doing completely different things to what your other stocks are doing at different times in the cycle. Uh, and so even and even within these markets. Um, so Ghana might be going through one of its usual busts. And then at the same time, you have like Senegal that's uh, that's booming. And Zambia might be going through debt restructuring. And then Tanzania might be booming. So it's, uh, it's like, yeah, like even across the continent. I mean, Africa is not Africa. Africa is in, in many different countries, each with their own Correct. dynamics and yeah. economies. So... So you your fund is a diversified way to to get to get exposure to that uh to that content. Yeah. Cool. Fantastic. Look, Tim, thank you for your time. So if anyone is interested in finding out more um about 
what Tim has to offer. There's his email below. There's also a link to his newsletter. Um, sporadically, um, not often enough, Tim, we need to discuss this, but not often <laughs> enough. He writes blog posts about some of the on the ground experience and information that he finds when he's traveling across the continent. Tim, you have not been writing enough. Um, in the past six months, you wrote like I'm, one blog post. Uh, I'm taking the writing... lazy option and, and just doing it on Telegram. I have a Telegram channel and I, I do a lot of commentary uh, in okay. there. But yes, I, I do have a, a blog. I think I wrote about my trip to Nigeria, but that was back in November. I was going to write something about my recent trip to Hong Kong. That's, uh, of course, not Africa related, but it's China and uh, Hong Kong related. So maybe maybe cool. that's going to come out soon. So there's a link to that um, newsletter, and there's also a link to the Telegram channel where you are uh, certainly a lot more active. Yeah, yeah, I'm a bit more active there, yeah. That's good. Okay, fantastic. All right, Tim, thank you. Cheers. All right. Nice seeing you, Ladislas. Take care. Make sure to download my free ebook, 12 Mistakes to Avoid When Investing in International Real Estate, which you can find on my website, link below, and feel free to follow me on Instagram at The Wandering Investor. I look forward to hearing from you.